The Surviving Generations of the Holocaust presents the testimony of Mrs. Stella de Leon. In a Nazi camp, 19-year-old Stella and her bunkmates composed. Crying night and day, and always calling, Madre mia, oh my mother. In the gas chambers, in the fire, they were burned. The children without sin, with songs they were burned. Tonight I have the honor of interviewing Mrs. Stella de Leon. My name is Esther Bailey. Shall we sit down? Mrs. De Leon, after seeing the photos of your family, I would like you to take us back. Where and when were you born? I was born in the island of Rhodes, which is near the Mediterranean, the GNC. And uh, I was born 1926, March 15, 1926. And uh, I was one of the the third child of my parents. They had eight children, six girls and two boys. And uh, <clears throat> I had my older sister's name was Donna. My second sister was Rachel. And my name is Stella. Then I had my other sister, the one, she lives in Canoga Park right now. Her name is Flora Fields. She used to be Hassan. And uh, then I had another sister, Jeanette. She died three days before she was liberated. And then I had another little sister when she was about 10 years old. She, was, uh, she went to the guest chambers with the rest of the family. And I had two sisters, the two older sisters. They were married, both married. One had a child, they both had children, two girls, one each girl, and she was expecting her second job when the Germans came to the island of Rhodes and they took us. And, uh, well, now, what do you want me to say, anything? Well, I'd like you to tell me about your family, beginning with your parents. Okay, both of my parents, they were born in the island of Rhodes, when my th father and mother, they were born. The island belonged to Turkey. In 1914, the Italians came. Then when I, all the children, when we were born, they, uh, we were Italian. My father was born in 1893, and my mother was born 1903, 1903, yeah. And my father's Morris Hassan, and my mother is Clara Raphael. And my grandfather, when my mother was growing up, my grandfather went to South Africa, not Africa, South America. And he wanted to bring, my grandmother had uh, two kids, my, my mother and another daughter. My grandma didn't want to leave her family. He ne she never followed her husband. After so many years, they never heard out about my grandfather. I don't know if he had remarried and had kids. I still don't know. I might have relatives in South America. And my grandma raised the two girls. One girl, she died when she was 18. The only one left was my mother. And my mother and father got married in 1921. And my older sister was born in 1922. In 1920, after they got married, 
uh, my uncle, uh, she had, my father had a brother and a sister living in the United States. They want my father to come to the United States. Till when they made the send the papers for them to come and the money, they had a cousin that want them to bring it. He was a young boy. After they made the papers and everything, the boy decided he doesn't want to go. Meantime, they couldn't change their mind. But then my mother started having the family. And that's the reason we stay in the honor of Rhodes, though I don't regret those years because my parents, they were the most wonderful, wonderful parents a person can have. My father worked hard for his family, make sure a good living for us. And my mother never worked, and she was very caring person, not only with her family, with her sister-in-laws, with her brother-in-laws. She always made sure she had the whole family over her house. I was growing up with holidays or picnics, had to be with the whole family. And I had a wonder, wonderful childhood, and we didn't know what it was a war or anything. In 1938 and 39, people started leaving the island of Rhodes. Quite a few, some of them they went to Africa, some of them came to the United States, and some went to Tangier. They displayed, they went to, some went to Turkey, because by then, the Italians, they were getting close with uh, Hitler. And people would start to worry. Though we didn't have to worry because we never had any, the, the schools, the food, everything. It was okay with us. They treated us good. We didn't know what it was a war till 1941, really. Mrs. DeLeon, can you describe your relationship with your mother and father? Well, my relationship with mother and father, it was wonderful. My mother used to tell us, wait, if I did something wrong, she would tell us, wait till I tell your father. And we were petrified because I don't know if it was respect. He's never, never lay a finger to any of the eight kids. He just had to look at us like this, and we were just, because the loving, the, the care he, both parents had for us, we weren't scared. Because they never, they yelled, my mother yelled at us, don't get me wrong, if we didn't think the way she tells us to do it, we, she yelled at us, yet it was with love and care. She was the most wonderful person a, a, a mother or daughter can have. Holidays came, we were with the family. She made sure everybody was taken care of from clothes, shoes, and uh, food, everything. Not only of her kids, she made sure her sister-in-laws had enough for the kids. She will do things for them because they were making a good living, though she made sure. Oh, sometimes my uncle was very sick, and she went and made the holidays, though she made sure the kids had food and they brought them to the house. It was, she was a wonderful person, caring person. I never knew my grandmother either way because when uh, my father was born, no, my aunt, the one in California, my grandmother died and my grandfather remarried. See, the, the first marriage, they had three kids and the other mother, the, the wife he remarried had two kids. And then they had four children together. And then when my youngest uncle was about eight or nine, his mother died. 
And then my mother was already married, and she took care. She raised the kids. She married my aunt. She married the boys. She was a caring, wonderful person. You don't find when we were growing up, my mother made sure the friends, boys, girls, we always went to in my house. They always congregated in my house. And what I saw when I was growing up, I did the same thing for my daughter. When my daughter was growing up, I had all her kids. She was very active with Benedictine youth and everything. She came to, everybody had to come over my house. And now my daughter, in turn, she does the same thing. I guess it's the way you see it when you're growing, that's the way you'll, it, it goes into the, your family. I hope I gave you the right answer. It was, yes. What kind of work did your father do? He did the manage of uh, this. They had a, about four different big stores. It was a company from Italy. They call it uh, the Alhada store. They had a big department. One was silver, uh, china and frames and stuff like this. The other ones they had uh, material. They were different stores. My father worked the one with, with China and friends. He used to manage that department. And my mother never worked. She was busy uh, raising children and going from house to house of the sister-in-laws and making sure she go shopping, bringing food, stuff like that. Tell me about your brothers and sisters. Well, my older sister, she was about five years older than me, four years older than me. She got married. She, my mother went again in one of the visits in the morning. It was visiting her daughter with a baby and everything. Then my aunt, see, we were six kids. We took turns in fighting. When you have six kids, we took turns fighting. My oldest sister, always, always stick by me. And my second sister used to stick by my sister, the one in California. We always alternate. We never took uh, one next to us. We always argue about that. And though it was fine. We got along beautiful. We were raised together. My mother had eight children. The love she had, my father, my, the love she had for my, for all the eight kids, it was no different one from the other. They love all equal, all the chick kids. I'd like you to identify these photos. Mm -hmm. That was my mother and father. That's when they were real young. When the, they looked like they were older, they were in their twenties when. My mother was 18 in that picture, and my father was just 28. Can you also tell me the names as you identify the photo? Sure. That was Clara, Clara, my mother, and what she was, Clara Raphael, then Hassan, uh, Moshe Hassan, that's my father. And that was his step uh, half brothers. These three pick three boys there. One was the aunt Viola, and the other one's Chili B, and the other one is uh, uh, Shilomo. The younger brother is not there. Now that one there, it was my older sister Donna, when she was a little girl. I have to put my glasses. They're too small. Okay. From right, uh, left to right, the first one, it was my sister Rachel. The next one, it's me. The next one is Flora. And the, the other one, the 
The last one is Donna. And that's my father with all the six girls. No boys there. From left to right in the first row, it was me, then my sister Flora, Rachel, and Donna. And my father was holding Jeanette, and the little one my mother's holding, it was Leah. And that one there, it was my sis older sister, yeah, girl. First girl, uh, the, she was Fortuné. And that's a picture of my brother. After six girls, they had to make sure they took a picture and send it to the United States to her uh, in-law, to her sister-in-law. What language was spoken in your home? In the home, we spoke Sephardic, it's Spanish. And at school, we spoke Italian, what the schools. What Ladino, what is that? Ladino is in the uh, fourth and in this, oh, I have something in my eye. In the 14th century, that's when they had the Inquisition for the Jews in Spain. And all the Jews had to go there and be, all become Catholics. Well, most of the Jews, they went the uh, Empire of uh, Turkey, received all the Jews they want to go there, they received there. Though all these centuries in the home, we, they always kept that Spanish, that the, by then, by the time I was born, it had a little bit of Turkish, a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Italian. It's a mixture of all kinds. That's the Sephardic speaking. And the, even the writing, it's like Hebrew. Can you describe your siblings and their personalities? Who? Your brothers and sisters. Well, like any other children, they were all, we all were well behaved. We fought a lot. We fought a lot. So I think we behaved very well for eight kids. I think my parents had a control of us. What kind of public and religious education did you receive? Okay, when I was younger, we went to the Jewish uh, school, which they call it La Alianza. Uh, my older sister went there, and my second, and me. Then it got too expensive for my parents to send us there. Then they sent us to public school. Be and we had to go a long way to go to school, and they were Catholic school, the nuns. Though the school, they made sure we had a rabbi there. Three times a week, we had a Hebrew lessons from this rabbi. And uh, we had, a, we learned how to read and write in, in Italian. So at home, we spoke Spanish, which I still can speak the Spanish, and I still can speak the Italian. Though, we had a lot of friends, Turkish, Greeks. We spoke their language, too, because they used to come to our house. We spoke to them. Now, I don't know. I can understand a lot of words in Turkish or in Greek. I haven't spoken for 45 years, 50 years, over 50 years. I forgot the Turkish, though the Italian I still can speak, and so the Spanish. What grade did you achieve? Well, I didn't achieve very high grade because of the, in 1940, I was 11 years old when I couldn't go anymore to school because of the, uh, in 1939, they said that we couldn't go to the Italian public school. And finally, with, I went one more year to the Jewish school, 
La Alianza. And then my mother couldn't afford it. We, I couldn't go anymore after 40. Which just actually, I just went about 30. Not very high. I educated myself by reading and doing things like that. What kind of relationship did your family and you have with the non-Jews in your community? We had a wonderful relation. We had a lot, a lot of friends. Greek, Turkish. The Italians then didn't live in where all the uh, sea over there in the island of Rhodes. It's uh, built from the, uh, what they call them, it's centuries and centuries. It was walls. Inside the walls, on one side lived the Greeks, and on the other side, the Turkish. And the Jews were right in the middle. And uh, we got along with both uh, religions very well. They were our friends. They used to come to the house. They always came to the house anyhow. And we were friends. We never had problems. What were your goals or dreams for your future? When I was young, well, I guess so maybe I was too young. I never thought of what, the, what goals or anything. When I was, let me go back a little bit. When I was nine years old, then I couldn't go, no, more, about 11 or 12. I couldn't go to school anymore. My mother put me in a seamstress to learn how to do tailoring, how to sew. I learned how to sew when I was 12 years old, and I still do a lot of sewing, a lot of tailoring. And uh, I never thought of what to do. I never, uh, we just lived for day to day and just having fun and stuff like this. Though I was, I had a boyfriend and he was after me and he went and I said, I was engaged. I was 16 and I was engaged already. My sister was 15, she was promised already too. Over there, you know, when you have a lot of girls, no money, you know, to give money for trousseau and stuff like this, diary, then they give you, you accept. Describe the first time you noticed anti-Semitism. The Greeks sometimes they had a little bit of anti-Semitics. Sometimes when the holidays used to come, Pesach, they used to be afraid to let the Greeks boys come around the Jewish people because we used to. Uh, they used to tell them that they were gonna we we're gonna kill them and use the blood, their blood for cooking because it's Passover, like they did Jesus Christ. It was a little bit, not too, too much. The Italians, they were wonderful to us till they, start, till they got with Germany. And then that's how trouble started then. We couldn't have kosher meat. And uh, it was a lot of, we would deprive a lot of extra things. Now we, do, we wouldn't deprive about food or anything because it was plenty of food to have. Just about meats and stuff like this. For two years, we never had anything, any meat. Finally, my mother says, well, my children need meat. What two years? Uh, between uh, 39 or 40, 41. Then finally, we start eating unkosher meat. All these years, we didn't uh, worry about the kosher or nothing because it was only kosher meat there to buy. Tell me about your sisters and brothers. What were they doing? Were they all living at your home? Oh, yes, except when they got married. They each had their own apartment. Otherwise, see, my mother made rules for all of us. She never did the cooking. It was she went and did the shopping and bring them home. Then my older sister did the cooking. My uh, second sister did the cleaning. And then we took turns, the other ones, to do the dishes. Then when my older sister got married, my second sister took the cooking. And we went in line. 
Then when it came up to me, I was doing the cooking because she got married then. I did the cooking and my other sister cleaning and that's the way it went on. To when it came for that, we didn't have any more chance because they took us. Mrs. De Leon, when you describe your family, could you please describe their names too? So that we can learn a little oh, bit about did them. My, oh, did their names. Mm -hmm. Well, my older sister is Donna. And Donna used to do the cooking. And Rachel used to clean the house. And what year did Donna get married? In 42, no, 41. Did she live at home? No, she, she lived all the time at home, yes. Till she got married. Till she got married. Then she went in the... Uh, she got her own apartment, yeah, because my niece was mar uh, born in 42. Uh, Fortuné was born in 42, and uh, she was two years old when, uh, two years old when they uh, took us to Germany. Could you please identify this photo? That's her daughter. That's Fortuné. That one Whose there. Whose daughter is that? That's my uh, Donna's daughter. Okay. And when was she born? In 42. Was there any anti-Jewish legislation? No. Yeah, we could not do a lot of things, yeah, like have, we didn't have no need of maids. A lot of Jewish had maids. They could not have maids because it was another religion and they could not have maids and stuff like that. Though otherwise they, we were missing anything else. Oh, yes, we did because they will, came Passover. They will not let the uh, Jewish people make the matzahs. And in order for us to have the matzahs, they used to buy the grain, and my father made a, a will, two wills, and with the turning, they had to make their own flour. And we used to have a little oven, you know, where you make pizzas or like that type. And all the family, everybody came to my mother's house, and they made their own matzahs. After we made the flour and everything, because you, they weren't allowed to make, was everything hush hush? They didn't know we were making matzahs. Did you notice signs of support from non Jewish people? Yeah, the Turkish, yeah, when the Germans came there, they were bombing. We went in the mountains where the uh, Turkish live, and we did uh, stay in their man, in the caves there, in the near the property, in their property, in their houses. We stayed with them. They were wonderful. And the guy invited us. It was a milkman. He used to bring, every morning, he used to come and bring the milk. And he was very good friends with my father. And since he came to my house, all of us, we run out with our cup. Plus, he leaves milk for pour for my mother to boil for the whole family. He always give us something with our milk to us in an each in a little cup by ourselves. It's not like here you buy the milk from the milk uh, from the uh, stores or anything. Over there, the milkman came with buckets full of milk, and you bring your pan and you measure how much milk he gives you, and you pay by the uh, what he gives you. And he used to give us, the, all of all the kids, we were there with the cups, and they used to give us milk like that. After the bombing, everyone went to the caves? Yeah, most of the Jews, they left the, uh, where, but it seems like where they hit most the bombs, they were where the Jews were. And it was like, it's a one incident, it's one girl there at one of the pictures I'm going to show to you, that her f whole family, it was, it hit a shelter, and the whole family was killed there. And what happened was, they dig her from the shelter, and she was alive. And a few months later, 
she ended up going to the concentration camp. She, she survived the concentration camp, too. Now she lives in Israel. Did you and your family go to the caves as well and stay in the caves? Yes, we did. My father used to come every day down uh, to the town and uh, go to work, and then he would go check the house and come up to the cave every night. Did you know who was doing the bombing? Uh, the Germans. And can you describe the caves? Uh, the, it's, it was in a mountain. In the mountain that you go in, and it was cool. We had blankets, beds, uh, uh, mattresses in the floor, and we slept in the floor there. How long were you there? I think about a month, about a month. What was the name of the caves? I don't know, then he had no name. And how far away were they from where you live, from the town? Oh, it was about, I don't know, we used to walk back and forth. About three miles, three, four miles. When did the German soldiers occupy Rhodes? In March 1944. Please describe the day's events. Uh, I can't recall. I don't remember too much about that. What I know is they were fighting with the Italians. And after the fighting with them, they're shooting each other and everything. And then they said the uh, Italians give in. And uh, that's when the Germans came in. What happened after that? My mouth's dry. After that, um, in July of 1944, uh, the SS came in. The, the ones that came before, it was just Germans. They didn't interfere with the Jewish people, with anybody there. The SS came in and went to the Jewish Community Center and said, we want a hundred men to do, to do some work for us. If don't, we're gonna kill all the Jews. Well, everybody, they figured they better go. And uh, when they, uh, when these hundred men, they put him in this building. When they were there, uh, then they came back to the Jewish Community Center again and said to the, uh, the uh, president, says, we want all the Jews to come to this building in 24 hours with their jewels, uh, their money, whatever they have valuable to bring it with them. Well, everybody hears somebody in there, or a father, a brother, an uncle, whatever you want to call a husband, you know. We were afraid they were going to kill the man. Everybody took their jewels and everything. We all went for uh, there that camp. In 24, less than 24 hours, we were in there. Less than 24 hours. In a few hours, matter of time, we were all in there. As a matter of fact, I recall when we were inside there, my sister forgot something for the baby. And I says, well, I'll go to the cave where you, you were, because my sister by then, she was staying with us, both sisters. Which sister was this? Donna and Ra Rachelle. They both were there with the kids. And I says, I'll go out and get it. I went to the, uh, the guy in the front. I says, I have to be, then it was the Jewish people there at the front, be, and next to the, uh, because if you went out of line, the SS was there. And he says, okay, you go. When I went to the uh, mountain there in the cave, the Turkish people there, they begged me, stay here, we'll hide you, don't worry. I said, uh-uh, I'm going back. I'm gonna go 
with my family. And I did go with my family. And we did get in the, in a matter of 24 hours, we were in those ships, cargo ships, all down the below. I don't know how many people. We were almost close to 3,000 Jews. And we all went there. They put us in the boats. And it was about four families, four or five families. They were Turkish citizens. The Council of Turkey came and said to the Germans, hey, this is my people. You cannot touch them. And they were out, out of that camp. They took them out. How many people was that? About 20, 25 people. And uh, then they put, start putting us in the ship. The, the Turkey consular was trying to get all of us out. Though they didn't give him a chance because he had to have papers and everything. When, I, when my father and my mother were born, Turkey was there. See, they were born under the Turkish regime. We were born in the Italian regime. The, when the, the Turkish consular couldn't do nothing because of, uh, they didn't have the papers for them or anything. And that's the reason the Germans knew that. They took us right away, they put us in the boats. And we traveled for 14 days Traveling just in night, not days. Days, we stop at close of an island or something in the mountains or any place. And in order to, uh, to, took 14 days, which this trip we took, it takes about three days. They took 14 days to get to Pireo. Pireo is in Greece. The port of Pireo, that's where we landed. And they took us from that boat, and they put us in this, uh, uh, Javier, uh, Javier, uh, what's the name? Javier. Javier, in Pireo. They put us there, uh, all the Jews. In the meantime, they were mean. They didn't give us no food, and we got sick in the boats. We lost few people in the traveling from the island of Rhodes to Pireo. Then when, by the time we got to agree uh, to uh, the, that uh, building, we lost quite a few elderly people there too. And then we were there for just three days. Then they put us in the trains, cattle trains, you know? And maybe 40, 50 for each cattle, maybe 100. I don't recall how many. I know we, I was with my whole family and my aunts. They were in the same cattle. I don't know how many we were in that train. Can we go back to the uh, boat for a minute? Sure. Do you remember what the sanitary conditions were? No, I don't. I truly cannot remember. As a matter of fact, I asked my sister. She doesn't remember. I asked three different people, the girls from the Island of Rose, none of us remember. I don't know where we blocked that part. I don't know. And the same thing went with the train. We were 14 days in the train. I know they didn't give us no food. How did we manage to get to the Auschwitz in the trains without having to go to the bathroom? I really don't know what we did. I don't know why that part is completely, I can remember. After you got to Hader, can you describe the people you saw? We saw there a lot of Germans, a lot of SS. That's all what we saw there. They put us in that barrack. They locked us there in that barrack for three days. Then they put us again in the train loads. And that's it. We didn't see anybody else than that. What was the condition of your family members? How many we were in the members? Well, what did you? What were you like? What kind of health were you in? We were all in good health. And they were all with you? Oh yes, the whole family. I had a little brother was four years old. 
the other one was, was huh? And his name was Jack. Yeah, and Joe was six years, uh, no, eight years old. Then Leah was uh, ten, and Janetta was twelve. My sister Flora was fourteen. I was sixteen. My sister uh, da uh, Rachel was nineteen, and my sister Donna was twenty twenty one. And her daughter was still with her? Oh, yes, all the way. And she was expecting any time. Then when we got to Auschwitz, when we, they were unloading, I was holding my little niece in my arms. I think so. That was fate because I was holding my little niece in my arms. And uh, my sister says, give it to me. And... Uh, I says, no, I'll carry it. In the meantime, we going down on the planks. They put planks, and we were walking down. And we were arguing, the two of them. And the German knew that my sister was expecting, you know. Her stomach was any time she was going to have it. And she knew that baby would even belong to me. He grabbed her, and thank God, he gave it to her. And threw it, not give it, threw it at her, the baby, and pulled me back the the other side. I went to the labor where the labor camps were. Now, in from the people of the Alna Roads, like I say, we were close to three thousand, close to that, and they separated three hundred people, a hundred and fifty boys and a hundred and fifty girls, and they put us to the other camp, which. It's a name that I can't remember, the name. It was in Auschwitz, though the camp it was named different. And the rest, they went on the other side, the left side, which that was the guest chambers and the, uh, and the furnaces. Oh, my mouth so Was this Auschwitz-Birkenau? Mm hmm Was this Auschwitz-Birkenau? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In Birkenau, we went that side. Auschwitz, the was the where the furnace is. That's why they call it Auschwitz. Birkenau was where the camp labor camps were. How did they make the selection then? They just picking one here, one there. What I know is, by the time we finish, we were 150 kids from the island of Rhodes. Now the train roads, they weren't only from the island of Rhodes. They were from. Uh, Greece, from uh, Salonika, from all over. And then every time we travel, we went to Hungary, Bulgaria, all all along. They keep picking train loads of uh, Jewish people from other places. When we got there, we had a train load of people. See what they kept doing to all of them, the same thing. So we did that. When you got to Auschwitz? When we got to Auschwitz. Then when we had to walk quite a bit to get to Birkenau, there where the labor camp was. We got there. Again, they put us in these barracks. They took all our clothes, and they sit us in a chair and shave us all over. They had everything. They, we were stripped. In the meantime, this was... Sad and not sad. Every time we look at each other, we cry. As bad as we were crying, and we'll say, oh, you look like your father. Oh, you look like your brother. We will laugh at that, too, though we were crying. Then they issue us one dress and pair of shoes and a blanket. And that's it. Nothing else. That was at 3 o'clock in the evening from the time we got, and we got all there. They gave us a shower and all that. Then they took us to the barracks, barracks 20. And there were there a lot, a lot of people there in that barracks. It was quite a few. I don't know how many was in each barrack, really. And uh, after we got there, the following morning now, we don't know nothing what's going on that we had to wait in line there at four o'clock in the morning they wake you up you went stay in line and do the counting now by then the first few days 
We didn't have our number because they called you by the number. Though they couldn't call us by the number because we didn't have it yet. Then after three days, we were there. They put, we went to another barrack, and we stayed there by the hours and hours standing till each of us got the number. And each, the way they put it, it was, it's each point I have here, it, they, had a, they had tables and tables of the Germans doing this. And each point, it was put with the ink. They pinch you, and the ink went in and mixed with the blood. And that's in the meantime, if we move, somebody's behind our house, they will beat you up. We had to stay still. The blood was coming all around and everything. Finally, the, after that, they called you by the number. We didn't know a word of in, uh, German. It made it hard for us. It, when they start calling the number, we didn't answer. Then they used to come with the rubber hose, hitting us, beating us. Were you ever beaten? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And the shoulder and the head, whatever the, was the handy pow they used to give us. And I had an end too, my aunt Viola was put it with us. Though after four, a week in the camp, they, she got sick, they put in the, uh, in the formatory. If you went in the formatory, that's it, you never saw the prison again because they put him right away at the guest chambers. Can you describe an event where you were beaten? Well, we were still in line and we didn't answer. See, once in the morning, once at night, when the people were going to work, see, they went out of the camp. And if you didn't, you had to stay there in line. And if you didn't answer the number, then they're right there. Not only the Germans, even the Blokovas, the Blokovas, they were a prisoners to themselves. They were Jewish. Though they've been there for a long time. Either one used to come and beat you up, answer. And that happened to you as well? Oh, yes. How many times? Quite a few times. Finally, the ones that took pity on us, it was the Hungarian people. They came and helped us. They start teaching us the number, uh, Achtung, Achtung means stay on attention. We didn't know what it meant. We didn't know what to do. Till we find, learn few words saying, Achtung means we have to stand up because the German is going to count you. And that's finally we, they start beating us because we understood what they were saying. Did you know where the rest of your family was? No, we didn't. The, uh, when uh, the workers came and started coming back to the camp, and they used to tell us, now you'll never see your family again, because they killed them already. We got really mad at them. I said, it's not true. It's not true. It's we, we're hoping we're going to see one of them, you know, the kids or something. Finally, at uh, about a couple of weeks, we realized it. In the meantime, every day, other train loads were coming. And as they were coming, we will go see if it was our family there. And it wasn't. They were ready. Excuse me. At the guest chambers and kill and burn them. And with the, by two, a week after, we could smell the flesh burning. You couldn't help it because that uh, chimney was burning constantly. And we could smell it. And one, about a week or two weeks after I was there, I went to look, a train load came, and we were watching what they were gonna do. And as I was watching this, I saw with my own eyes. This German, a mother have this little six months old baby. And this German told her to give to somebody the child. And she didn't want to give up the child. The German got so mad at her, she grabbed the child, turned her upside down, and tore that child in half, split it in half. 
and threw it under the railroad tracks. Now, can you see a mother seeing that? It's uncanny what the things we saw, the things the Germans did, it was unhuman. It was bad. Yet we knew when I was in that camp, yet I knew I, in my mind that I was going to survive. I was going to get out of there. I was going to find my family. I was going to, in back in my mind, I said, no, we're getting out of here. We are going to get out of here. Then in order to survive too, what we did is they issued us that blanket. It was getting by November, October, November was getting very, very cold. By then we were going to take the, the, the uh, dig ditches and uh, take the snow of the railroad. We were doing all that. In the meantime, we just had one pair of shoes, wooden shoes, and one dress, nothing else. And what we did is we took one blanket because we were four girls in one spot, and we always were together. We took one blanket, we ripped it apart. You know, the way it was made the blanket, it made it into a yarn. We took from the bed, we clipped a couple pieces of wood, and we made like a needles, and we knit uh, scarves, hats, like this, we wouldn't be cold. And that was part of the one thing we survived about that. Then about November, they decide, the Russians, they get, December, the Russians, they're getting close by. They better start moving people out of there. And uh, they, uh, where the gas chambers, we march where the gas chambers are. We, I went through the gas chambers, and still giving me gas, they give us water. We waiting there any minute. To, by then, we were there already three, four months. We knew what was going on, and waiting for the gas to come and suffocate us. But we had water. By the way, we start crying and everything. They give us a shower. They issue us another dress and another pair of shoes, and they put us in the train load. Again, we went towards Germany. Before we talk about the train load, could you please tell me about the tattoo that you received? Yeah. What do you want to know? Can I, can I have you roll up your sleeve a little sure. bit? Sure. Here. Can you read the numbers? It's, no. I cannot. Yeah. I know it by heart, though I still have to look. A for Auschwitz. Then it's a, a mark here. Then it's two, four, three, four, eight. That uh, eight for Auschwitz, and that's how many people were there before they marked my number. Could you say the number one more time, Mrs. Sure. Two, four. Three, four, eight. See, you can see it. Please hold your arm steady. Thank you. Now we're going to take a break. Mrs. De Leon, we're continuing from the break. It's not clear to me how many of your family went with you to the Birkenau camp. We were 14, the whole family. That's including my brother-in-laws, my two nieces, my six sisters, with, including with me and two brothers, my father and mother. 
That's the immediate family I'm talking. There were plus his cousins, uncles, aunts. It was quite a few. See, the media, media family, it was almost 14. Who got separated in the initial separation at Auschwitz, and can you tell us their names? Yes. We were separated. My aunt, Viola, came separated to labor camp. Then it was me, Stella, and then it was my sister, Flora, where she lives in Canoga Park. And then it's my sister Jeanette. She was 12 years old. She got there at the labor camp. And just the four of us. Though my aunt survived just not even a month and a half. She got sick, and they put her in the gas chambers too. Then we were left, the three of us together. We went through the whole camp. Jeanette died three days before we were liberated. So your aunt, who was one of the four. My father's, yeah, father's She, she died initially then? Yes, she died in Auschwitz. And, and then the three of you stayed yes, together? Yes, yes. And then who specifically? At the time, did you know what happened to the rest of your parents and no. your sisters and brothers? No. We did not know. Even the labor guys that went and did it, it came and told us, your parents, they did. They, we put them in the gas chambers and that. We got mad at them because they're liars, we call them. Though eventually we realized that they were gone. So that was the last time that you saw them? When they say prayers, that's the last time I saw the rest of my family. In the barracks, mm -hmm. were people helping each other? Were there fights? Well, no, they weren't helping each other. We were like a little groups, you know, not like in our bed, it was me, my two sisters, and another girl, it's in the pictures, I'll uh, show it to you later. Uh, her name was Vicky. And Giovanna, the five of us, we always stick together. We sleep in the same bed. We always were together. We were through the whole camp together once. And the minute we got there, till the minute we got liberated, we were all together. Did the rest of the people in the camps help each other? No, because if you didn't eat your bread, they, you put it under your pillow, during the night they came and stole your food, your bread, or you stole your shoes, or they stole anything you have around. The shoes, we have to put it in the back of our head, like this, they won't steal them. And who's they? The other prisoners, the other girls. They're, I'm not talking from the girls from the island of Rhodes, there were there a lot of girls, Poland girls, uh, from uh, about, um, not from uh, all over the country. They were there, and they were stealing the stuff. Like they issue us a piece of bread and a soup in the morning. No cereal in the morning, which if you want to call it cereal, was more water than cereal, dirty water. And for dinner was another piece of bread with soup. It was cabbage and water, and that's it. And in that soup, always tastes like medicine because they put medicine there to sterilize us. Like this, we wouldn't get no periods, no nothing. Well, I guess so that's, can you imagine? all these girls there with periods and stuff like this. They had to do. I think that's more for sanitary than this. Though I was sterilized till I was 21, I didn't get back my period. And like me, a lot of girls, they never got it back. You talked before about the Hungarians. Yes. Which, who were they? The Hungarians, regular Jews, Hungarians, they went to Hungary and get them. And they went to camp like we did, like they took uh, the Greeks and Italians, all of them. The Poland's, the Germans, they were there. We were a mixture of everything there. 
And uh, that's like if you went to bed and if you didn't watch your piece of bread you left for later on, it was stolen. And then we used to go to my, I was a ch big chicken. I never went to steal anything. My sister, the one in California, Flora, was the one who always ran to get the food for us. And she used to go in the kitchen, behind the kitchen, and steal uh, potato peelings, cabbage peelings, all that we could survive because what we had was not enough food. And finally, uh, that's the way. One day, they were, that was not in Auschwitz, though. I'll tell you that story of the shoe later on because that was in Dachau. And uh, there, another thing there in Auschwitz, see the camps for the men and the camps for the girls was one next to each other, and it was just electric wires separating the two camps. And uh, one of the girls from the Island of Rhodes, she was about my age. She had her father and her brother on the men's camp. They put them to work. And she felt sorry for her brother and her father. The mother went right away at the gas chamber, so she wasn't with her. Just the two sisters they were, Rochelle and Esther. Esther. And Rochelle went to paste her soup. Now the uh, bowls of soup, it was this big. And uh, if she tried to paste it through underneath the, to the wires, the bowl touched the wire. And she was pushing the ball, and she got electrocuted by just that alone. She died right there in front of us. We were all sitting there, and she died right there, got electrocuted. Were you or your sisters assigned to work? Yeah, we went to the ditches that go to, uh, in our streets, they just take the snow out of the ground, you know, the railroad, clean the, and uh, we'll go to the ditches. Stuff like that. And what did you do to pass the time? Sit around and talk, and that's it. If when we went to work, you didn't have time for nothing because they took you there at 5 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock, because 4 o'clock they wake up, uh, they put us in there to the lines, and then at uh, 6 they took you to uh, the labor, and you came at four, uh, 5 o'clock back. You were so tired, you ate that soup and that piece of bread, and you went to bed. So when you talked, did you, uh, did you compose any poems? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We did uh, compose a poem. We used to sit there and start. It was some tune in Sephardic. I don't know. I don't remember the tune now. And then we start putting words together in Spanish, in Sephardic words. And we put a lot of tunes. Though when we come, I came to the United States, some girls went to Africa. One of the girls in Africa, she remembered the whole thing. And she wrote it. She made the whole thing and sent it to people, the girls in the United States. My sister made a copy, and she sent me one. That's got a, I got a hold of that. Can you read a stanza for me? It's right there on the table. And this was in Ladino? In the Ladino. Okay. okay, I'm going to read it to you in Ladino. Llorando noches en días, I amando siempre, madre mía. You want me to translate it? Yes, please. Okay. Crying day and night and calling my dear mother. Then it goes, el gas asofeciando, en el fuego los quemaron, las criaturas sin pecado, Constante fueron quemados. Okay. Uh, they, they were went to, uh, they were suffocated 
by the gas and burn a lot uh, they uh, burn them the little kids without a scenes they went there to the gas chamber and get burned thank you how long were you in Auschwitz we got there in August and we were there till November thank you after that after that, we went to the, uh, they took us. Oh, in the meantime, we had to pass inspector, inspection before they put us to go to the other side, to the Auschwitz where the gas chamber. In order to pass that, we had to have color on our face. And what we did is we stole a, a, um, beets from the kitchen, the, uh, um, the, Peelings for beads, and we put it in our face to look like we were healthy. It even if we were healthy, to look like we were healthy. And we did piss, the three of us, my sister Flora and me, and my sister Janetta, all three of us passed the inspection. Then after, like us, was Lara and Vicky Cohn, the same, the other girl was all the time, and Giovanna. Those, the five of us, we were all together all the time. We were inseparable. And we went to the other side where the gas chamber is. When we got there, we didn't know why they brought us there. And when we went through the, see, I don't know if you saw the uh, Schindler's List. In that, it shows you the light blinking. Well, we went through in that room. We went through the showers. When the light was turned green, means they give you water. If it was red, means they were gonna give you gas. Meantime, they can put all of them in one. And few went ahead of us, and we could see the light was red. Means, no, the, the light was green. Means they give them water. Then we knew we were gonna be suffocated. And then they issued us another dress and another pair of shoes, because when they took us, they took everything again. And they put us, they, let, uh, we, they loaded the trains again the same way. This time, instead of going back to where we came, we went the other way to Germany. To, uh, we went to Dachau. In Dachau, before we went to Dachau, we were about two weeks in another camp. I don't recall the name of the camp. And there in that camp, the barracks, they were small barracks. They weren't big. They were, uh, because it was almost like an underground. You have to go five steps to go in, then because the snow will cover it. And we went in there, they had a little bunks, which wasn't really bad. We went there, they put theirs to uh, labor again. The, uh, we went and steal cabbage, potatoes. We had a good dead camp there. because And yet, we used to go every morning. We went to work. The work they put us, it was cleaning barracks of the German soldiers. See, the Germans, they, they were retreating back. They were already closing German because the... Uh, their allies, they were coming close. And uh, we went and cleaned their, their cab cabins. And by then we knew a little bit of German, you know, a few words more here and there. And they said they didn't know what was going on. God knows the, who are was the true. Though they said they didn't know. They felt bad. They didn't know what was going on. These were the German uh, soldiers. soldiers. Not the SS, the soldiers. Can we and we were there in that camp, that little small camp, not very long. Then they transferred us to Dachau. Dachau, too, it gave, had furnaces there. They had the gas chambers, the furnaces, and a lot of bad things in there, too. Well, we were there to... February, no, in January, the end of January. Again, 
Can we just go back to um, Dachau when you first got there? No. Oh, yeah, Dachau. Yeah. That's when we're getting now, Dachau. Right. What, what were your impressions? What did you see when you first got there? Just barracks and people walking around doing nothing. Were there children there? No. No. No children. And From males and time, females were separated? Yeah. From the time we got to Auschwitz to we were liberated, we never saw children. Never. How were the prisoners processed in Dachau? Uh, it's still, I can't recall too much out of that then. By then I was getting, we getting a little bit tired and sick. You know, I really can't recall too much out of that camp. I know my sister used to go steal. They had uh, digging the ditches, potatoes and all that. I know she went and stole all that stuff. Which sister was that? The Flora. Flora. She went and stole all that stuff. And then one night, one girl says, come on, Flora, TV, bring in la, loads Claire Health One. She lives in California now. Come on, they're bringing load trains of uh, potatoes. Come on, let's go. And she got up and go. They were running. And after they got to the where the potatoes were, the Germans were waiting for them. And all of a sudden, the lights went on, and my sister was trying to run, and she lost her shoe. And she grabbed something. She grabbed a cabbage. And she ran with that cabbage, holding it in her hand. And then when she came inside the barracks, scared stiff, and the, she looked, she had a cabbage instead of the shoe. And then Claire, that lady, that girl, she says, uh, just don't worry, she says, I'll find you a pair of shoes. I'll find you a shoe. And she went to walk around. She went to the, in the next barrack, next, and the next person, but a few, uh, little bit farther down, and she stole the shoe and brought it to my sister. She said, here, take it. And my sister looks and says, you brought me the wrong uh, shoe because I have the right. I don't have the left. She says, okay, give it to me back. She went again. She changed it. She made sure she brought the right one. In the meantime, now we're not thinking the next person is not going to have a shoe. We're just thinking in order to survive, we had to do that, you know? And if we have any bread or anything and we went outside, when we came back, nothing was there. It was stolen. Amongst you and your sisters, who was there a leader in the group? No. My sister was the top. She always went and did, run to get the stuff and uh, everything. I was a big chicken. I didn't want to do it. And... Uh, my uh, younger sister didn't do much either. Jeanette didn't mm -hmm. do much. It was my sister Flora always ran and got the potatoes and got the whatever in order to survive. Till we got into Bergen-Belsen. How was staying with Adahra for a minute? Can you describe how this camp was different from Auschwitz? It was a smaller camp. And what was a typical day like? Going to work. Go to the uh, ditches and again the snow and stuff like this. It wasn't like the small camp going cleaning barracks. This was just labor, you know, digging ditches and digging the snow out of the grass. The trucks can drive and stuff like that. What was your most vivid recollection of Dachau? Just stealing the stuff. That's the only thing I remember when my sister came without a shoe. And there, what did you do to pass the time? We didn't have time to pass because we were going to work. We work every day. And then by the time we came home and eat that piece of bread and that water soup, we were ready to sleep. How long were you there? I think we were about a month there. And what happened next? Then we walked from Dachau all the way to Belsen, Bergen-Belsen. How long was that? Uh, I can't remember. I know it took over a day to walk. And 
by the time we got it to Bergen Belsen, a lot of girls die, or a lot of people die, you know, not through the people of the island of Rhodes. The other people, the other prisoners, the ones that have been there before and stuff like this, you know, and the Germans hitting them and everything, we walked to Bergen Belsen. What were the conditions like when you were walking? What time of year was it? Snow in the winter in January. And in Germany, it snows a lot. And yeah. what kind of clothes did you have to protect Just you? Just one dress and a pair of shoes. Wooden shoes still? Wooden shoes. Through the whole camp was wooden shoes. Do you remember anything about the guards? They were mean, mean. They were always, and the dogs, and the, they always carry a rubber hose. If you didn't move, pow, they will uh, hit you in the head, whatever. The, if you, it's your face in front of you, that's why they hit you. If you shoulder anything, that's why they hit you. Did anything happen to you or your sisters that you saw on that walk? No. Mm -mm. We walk. We drag, though we walk because we still have some strength till we got to Bergen-Belsen. And did everyone survive this, this walk? Not everybody, but some older people died there too. Some of them, they died, they dropped dead, you know. Though we survived, the girls from the Island of Rhodes, we were there in that particular march and the particular camp, we were almost together. We survived about 30 girls. On the walk, did you walk through any towns, through any cities? Did anybody see you, any German citizens? No, I don't remember, no. No. Mrs. DeLeon, when did you arrive at Bergen-Belsen? At Bergen-Belsen, I think it was the 1st of February. The first part of February. Can you describe your first impressions, what you saw? Well, it wasn't bad when we got there. It was just a barrack. Uh, I think, I know it was a big, big barrack. And I know it was a lot of people there. As a matter of fact, I have the statistics, what they are. I have written down, and I know the first month we were there in January, we weren't there then, 6,000 people died in that camp. In February, uh, 10,000 died. In March, 17. April was 17,000. Between April 15 till May, it was another 17,000. And in that barrack, I don't know, it, the whole camp wasn't a big camp. In one barrack, it was over 1,100 people. When you first got there, what were you thinking? What did you see? Just people, people. And we got there, we looked in just the people, and they put us in this barrack. The barrack we were, now you figure, it was, about 20 feet long and about 10 feet, uh, five feet wide. They put in that small space, we were 30 girls sleeping in the floor. No blankets, no nothing, just the wooden floor. And what were the conditions of the people that you saw? They were not too bad then. Then they stopped giving us bread, they stopped giving us soup or water, you know. Then it came in the point that the only reason we were surviving is, like I say, my sister used to go to the garbage, and we used to eat the uh, peelings of potatoes, and we thought they were delicious. They were wonderful. We survived on that, on those potato peelings. And... See, this is what I'm saying is garbage. We were eating garbage. After eating all that garbage, and uh, what the, you know, I know we start getting weak, 
by the first week in March, we start really getting losing the weight because we would no food, no water. But uh, but the end of March, my sister, the one who always ran to get the garbage to get everything, you know. She went, and they used to issue us water once a night, in the middle of the night, water. They opened the water, the faucets. And if you got water that night, then you survived. If you didn't get it, you have to wait for the following day. And if you were sick, you didn't get water, you died. Like in the morning, nights, when we went to sleep, you never knew if the next person next to you it was going to be alive. How many times the next person to me in the morning, when I got up, it was dead. You just grab them and throw them outside in the piles and piles and piles of dead people. They never bury it. They never burn it. Nothing. They just, you take the people and throw them out. And one night, my sister went to get water. And as she was getting the water, she fell on top of the older people because they're trying to get water, and they were falling done and uh, she come to me she says I'm dead don't talk to me anymore because I'm dead and that girl my sister Flora did not talk for three full weeks because she figured she was dead then I had to be the strong one I had to go get the water by then uh, we all getting sick we were getting typhoids disinfectory and then that we had our bodies was full of lice you put your hand like this you get handfuls of lice living things in our bodies it was a skeletons you know you get TB and uh, typhoids my younger sister Janetta died of typhoid three days before we were liberated and uh, I know I had typhoids, and I had the lice all over my body, and, and I had TB. I had all three of them. Don't look at me now, I'm healthy, though I weighed less than 60 pounds when they, I was liberated. And it was really, we could not stand up, we cannot... Uh, we crawl. If we want to go to some place or talk to somebody, we crawl because you can stand up. That's how bad it was. To me, Bergen Belsen, I call it the death camp. There, I figure that's the end of me. For all the time I was in the camps, in Auschwitz and everything, I always had the feeling I'm going to survive. I'm going to get out of here. Though by time all this, by time the end, the middle of April, I figure no way I can survive and get out of, especially after my little sister died. That's it. I'll be going pretty soon too. Though I say out loud, it's no God. If it's God, won't let us suffer like this. And believe it or not, like a miracle happened, that afternoon the camp was liberated where were you when your sister died next to her right next to her when she died and I grabbed her and threw it outside like the rest of the people Did you have a chance to share any last words with your sister? No. At the end? No. Mm -mm. What do you think Flora meant when she said that she was dead? Because she figured she was dead. See, laying on top of those dead people, she was dead too. As time went on, did the soldiers act any differently? Germans? Mm -hmm. No. 
they were meaner. As a matter of fact, after we were liberated, they were trying to get the people out of the Bergen-Belsen camp. And uh, we find out they find barracks full of bread. That bread was poison because they were going to give it. Since they had a chance, they were going to give it to us. So they didn't have, they, uh, British came to, they weren't expecting them that fast. Now, who said it was poison, the bread? The soldiers. The they, British soldiers? The British soldiers. That bread was poison. See, they already cut all the food, and they already cut the uh, water, except once a night. And they didn't issue no, no bread we didn't have at least for four weeks. We didn't have no food, except we lived with the garbage. Did you work in Bergen-Belsen? No, no. And how long were you there? Well, we got there the end of uh, the, the end of February, the middle of February, till April. We were liberated. They then transferred us to another camp, which was close to Bergen-Belsen, though it's a cleaning where the soldiers were. My sister, they took her right away, and when the, the, we were liberated, she went straight to the hospital. That's the only time I was separated from my sister Flora. When the, we were liberated, they were taking all the, uh, all the sick people in the trucks. When they came there to take us out of that ca uh, cabin, they had to put a, a, no, uh, nothing to show when they grabbed the people or everything. So they had to cover themselves? Themselves, mask and everything. And who was they? The soldiers. And were these were the British it's soldiers? It's not really, not even the soldiers. It was like the Red Cross. See? That's who it was. They came in to take the people out of that camp, put them in trucks, take them to the hospital. Now, they took me, they put me to this Italian camp soldiers, Italian soldiers. And they're the ones that heal us. When we got there, we didn't know how to walk. We didn't know. We, didn't, we were skeletons, let's face it. They bathe us. They fed us. They clean us. They medicate us. They did everything you can think. Then, in a month's time, we were feeling much stronger. And that's when we went. The, we knew that we were Italians. And in order to go to the, we figured we were going to go back to the Alano Roads, we had to go to Italy. And when we got to, uh, we, the, the soldier says, we'll take you guys to Italy. And we got on the train, a regular passenger train now. And we went to Rome. Now these were the Allied soldiers? The, no, the Italian soldiers. soldiers. They were prisoners themselves. They were just liberated by the British. Now they were going home. What were the expression of the soldiers as they entered the camp? They could not believe it, what was going on. Uh, there were um, some newspapers men there. They, could, they saw they were so bad, they could not take a picture. They could not tell about a radio, send a radio message or anything because they couldn't stand the thought of saying what they seen. That's how bad it was. No human being can survive out of there. See, and that's what the Germans wanted. They wanted to kill every single one of them, especially in Bergen-Belsen. There they figured if they people survive out of that camp, it's going to be a bad thing. Now, now who did they want to kill? All the Jews. All the prisoners there, we were in that camp. And that's the reason they had the poison bread. They didn't want no survivors in that camp because they figured they're going to come out and say what they, they did. If they didn't have no survivors and then they were going to burn the camp, they didn't have no proof. Did the soldiers ask you any questions or any of the other The prisoners? Italian? Mm -hmm. the, oh, yes. We told them exactly what went on and everything, and uh, they were wonderful to us, really. Those soldiers, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't survive. By then, when I started getting a little bit better, 
then I was still sick from the typhoids, from the disinfectory and all that. I was still sick. By the time I got to Rome, they found out I had TB. And how old were you then? I was about 18. I had TB. And they had to put me in the hospital, in the sanitarium for six months I was there. And where was the sanitarium? In Rome. Yeah. And there, it was a lady. And this man, Signor Angelo, you know, they live in Rome. She was Jewish. He wasn't. They wouldn't marry. That man and that woman, they had a beautiful, beautiful apartment in Rome, Via Condotti, one of the most expensive. This woman and this man, what they did, I don't think so another human being can do what they did to us. She took a hundred kids in her house, fed them, and make sure everybody was healthy, take us to the doctor. That's how they found out I had TB. Because I had a, a lump right here, all over here. See, you can see the surgery. I had a surgery, they had to take the, those glands out because I don't have that thyroid glands now because they were all taken when I had my TB. And uh, they uh, give me that surgery. Uh, no, first I was six months they were treating me to see if that infection, all the infections got settled there, if it would go away. They didn't. Finally, they moved me to another hospital and they had to give me surgery, take all these glands out in order to cure the TB. And it took me two good years to get back to normal in Rome. And this lady, Madame Victoria, Signora Victoria, and uh, she was an angel from heaven. And her, her male friend too, you know. She lived together with the men because she couldn't marry her because the Catholics don't believe in divorce. Could you please identify the next two photos? Okay. Now, I have to put my glasses because that's... Now, from left to right, on the bottom line, that's Sarah Hanan. She was... She is in California. Then is Madame Victoria. That's the lady I'm talking. And then the other one is Claire Hoffong. She lives in Los Angeles. The second road is Rochelle Nah uh, Nahmias. She was she's in Israel. And the other one is Laura Varon. She lives in Seattle. And uh, the other one is Sir Manin. Uh, I don't re I don't really remember her name. Now the next one is Zimbul. That's La Signora Victoria's sister. She wasn't in camp. She lived in Rome with her. And the other one is Vicky Cohn. That's the one I told you we were all together. Even we came to the United States almost the same time. And the next one is me. And then the man is Signor Angelo. That's the man led a hundred kids stay in his house. We were all over. Every room had 20 and 30 kids in the floor. She made sure she got mattresses for everybody to sleep in the floor. Were all these girls outside of Victoria with you in the camp? No. The sis her sister, Madame Victoria, and the uh, senior aunt were in camp. The rest, they were all. The rest were. Mm-hmm. Please identify the next photo. Okay. Now, that Matika Shahon is the one done on this side, Madame Victoria, Sarah Hannan, she's in Los Angeles, and uh, Madame Victoria's sister is in Bull. Yeah, the two of them, they were in camp, the other two, they weren't. Did you uh, have a chance to find out, or did you try to find out what happened to you, the rest of your family? We know they were killed. We knew 
By the time we went through the gas chambers and we knew what it was there, and that's it. We knew they were killed there. We tried every camp we went, every place we went, we looked for them. We know they were gone. There's no way. By the time we got out of the concentration, we tried uh, to, you know, we tried to get, see if they, any of my little brothers, my sister, somebody. No. We never did find anybody. Can you look at this photograph? I'm sorry about your glasses. And can you tell me how this affects you when you see it? How can I tell you? It's a hard, hard. I have it in the photo I have all the time. Every day I see it. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes I says, well, that's what God wanted me to do, survive. I can have kids and br carry the, uh, uh, not how to, the legacy of my family, of my father, of my mother. And that's the only way I can describe how I feel about that picture. See, like I say, some days I cry, and some days I feel blue, and then I figure, well, me crying is not going to bring him back. I have to live for myself. I have to live for my grandchildren. I have to live for my kids, and that's the only way I survive. I'm a survivor. That's the reason I survive. To what do you uh, attribute your survival? Why the will to live. See, seven years, uh, almost eight years now, I lost my husband with a heart attack. We went on vacation and he died there. It's just the struggle. And you figure, this is the way God wants it. That's the way I'm going to live. And having the strength to believe in God, that's, I think, so this part of surviving. What was the next step for your sister and yourself? Well, we were in Rome. Let me get some water, please. Mm -hmm. Then, through the Red Cross, my aunt, the one in California, find out. She, see, one of the girls, I'll show you the picture, had a sister in Los Angeles. She knew her sister's name and who she was married to. And we, she knew that her sister was a sister-in-law to my aunt, you know. Through the Red Cross, she, uh, she got her, uh, hold of her sister, the address. And to her, she told them when she uh, wrote the letter through the Red Cross, she told them who, who was alive. And my aunt, right away, her sister called my aunt because that's her sister-in-law. And my cousin, the one she lives in California, thank God to her, she right away, she got anxious and everything and started making papers. My uncle and my aunt brought me and my sister to the United States. They paid the fare. They did everything for us. She's like a mother to me. That, that cousin and mother, mine, they're like sister. Did you recover any possessions, any photos of your family, anything well, at all? The only pictures I have is the ones I've been showing to you through my aunt. And in the same time, the only other possession I have, one my sisters they were getting married it was a tradition the mother of the uh, bride makes a trousseau one of the girls her brother was married to my sister Rochelle and she had a boyfriend uh, in Rhodes in the island of Rhodes and he was an Italian he wasn't a Jewish and he kept all that stuff for her and one she, he sent her the stuff. A lot of the stuff was my mother's made it because it was my sister's trousseau. 
though the only thing I got from her is this piece here. See, this is made with a sewing needle, this point here, everything. Every stitch is different. And my mother made quite a few pieces like this because she was beautiful with her handworks, crochet, embroidery. She had a lot of stuff. And this is the only thing I have in my mother. That's beautiful. Believe it or not. When you hold that lace, what comes to your mind? What do you feel? Well, it's close to my heart. And I figure, God willing, eventually I'll give it to my daughter. And she can pass it to her daughter. Because this will never wear out. Can you identify these photos coming up? Okay. Now, this is Giovanna Israel. She's in one of the other girls. She was the five of us. We were together. She's another one like that. She lives in Israel now. Her whole family was killed. She's the only one survived in her family. She had quite a few in her family. Now, that one there is Flora Junio. She and my mother, they were first cousin. My sister and her, they were named by the same person, the same person. She's in Africa. Now, okay, see, one of them, the middle one is Sarah Hannon. She lives in Los Angeles. The other one is Matika Shahom, the one I was telling you. And the other one is Franco. She is the one, the girl they took out of that bombing. When they bomb, I told you they find her. Her whole family was killed in, in the bombing. She was the only survivor. Now, this is Vicky Cohn. That's the, the other girl she's always with us. And the other one is Madame Victoria, sister Matilda. She, she was in Beirut when the, all this went. And she came to Rome, then eventually she came to the United States. Now was this, which girl was it, left or right? At the left, the first, the, uh, that one there. That was Madame Victoria's sister. She was living there with her and her baby. And the other lady, the older lady, she was from Beirut too. She came to there to Rome. She was standing there too. And they came, in fact, with the older lady, that's who we came to the United States. Could you please re-identify this photo and start from the left and go to the right? Okay, from the left, the first one, first row, is Franco, I told you. She's the girl. She, they got her out of the bomb. Her whole family it was killed in uh, Rhodes. And she went through camp, and she survived the camp. The, uh, the one on the right, it's the first row, is Matika Shahom. Her whole family died too. She's the only survivor. And the other one, her whole family died, Sarika Herna. She lives in Los Angeles. That's Rochelle Almelech. She's another survivor. She's was a, we were all together. We, she was from Bergen Belsen too. That's Sylvia Hasson. She wasn't in Bergen Belsen. She was in another camp. This girl, she came to the United States. She lived with her brother. Then she was very unhappy here. She went to Africa and got married. She still lives in Africa. And her name Sylvia Hasson. What happened next? Well, next then I came to the United States. When did you leave Italy? I left in nine, May of 1947. I came to the United States. And how did you come to America? I came with a regular visa. My aunt did send the money. She got me the papers. They were, she was gone. And I had to make myself a year older 
See, I was born 1927. Though I go, I was born 1926. The reason I did that, because I have to make myself a year older in order to come to get a regular visa. They were issuing a special visa for the people display. They were uh, refugees. Though they didn't pay for my way or anything, my aunt did. Though she made the papers like she's responsible for us, you know? And uh, she's responsible for us, and that's how we came to the United States. Now, did you go with Flora? Flora came six months before I did. She got her visa just sooner than I did. And she came in January, I came in May of the same year. And then Flora got married in 1948, and I got married in 49. Now, why did Flora get to come earlier? Well, I don't know. When she went to get her visa, she went with a bunch of girls. They were, they were issu issuing 10 visas. Well, by the time it came to me, the visas was finished for that part of the time. I had to work on a different way to come later. See? That's why she came early than I. Could you please identify this photo? That's me. When was that taken? That's in 1948. And where was it taken? In Los Angeles. So the city you went to first was Los Angeles? Los Angeles, yeah. And I lived there till 1949. Finally, a friend of my aunt came to Los Angeles and she saw me. She says, you have to send Stella on vacation. You have to. And I came up here, and uh, my sister-in-law now, my husband's sister, it was married to her son. Now, up here where? In Seattle. And uh, it was married to her son. And that's, he ca they came to see me, and she says, then... She was telling her mother-in-law that she has a brother. He was divorced, had her son, and uh, then we went to a picnic. The first, first time I met my husband was went to a picnic with the, their family, and he was there, and they introduced me to him. I didn't think anything of it. Though he went and told his sister to call on me for dinner because he wanted to be there. And he called. He came and took me out. And six weeks later, we got married. And we were married. When he died, we were married 39 years. And he's been gone now so seven and a half, almost seven, eight years. Okay. Those, they are Bella. Now, the, the girl there, the front one. Can we do left to right? Left. That girl, I have to put my glasses. I can't read. That's okay. No problem. Okay. Now, the first one from left to right is Bella. Uh, I don't know her name. I forgot her name. I know it. Uh, I forgot. Anyhow, that's the girl she had her sister. That's the one she tried to get her sister to the Red Cross. And her sister was married to my aunt's brother-in-law. And that's how my aunt got the names. Okay. The next one is my sister, Flora. The next one is Sarah Hannon. I, uh, she's been in quite a few pictures. And the other one is Sylvia Hassan. That's when they came to the United States. People were asking, and a paper came there in Los Angeles, and took the, they were all in Los Angeles. I wasn't even here then. Took their numbers. I was still in Rome. Now, what were people asking? Questions, you know, how, the, how bad they were and everything. By the time I came to the United States over my aunt, all the relatives, they already asked the questions to my sister. And when I came, nobody asked me anything. 
You mean the questions about the what question, happened in the concentration camps? Yeah, camps. how many, if my mother's alive or my aunt. Everybody wanted to know their relatives who were alive. That's my marriage license. Mm -hmm. And that's my husband and me. Where was this photo taken? It was uh, in Los Angeles. We went on vacation and we took that picture. We were married already a year. So you were on vacation in Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. I went to visit my family. That's my citizenship papers. That's what I uh, became a citizen in 1962. That's my birth certificate from Greece. I had to have a birth certificate, and they wrote it in Greek. The Italian one, the Italian consulate has it. I didn't get it back yet. That's a, an, uh, a paper from the island of Rhodes identified that I was born there and I was taken to concentration camp. That's the same one there. This is a, a letter from the doctor did the surgery for me. And I had to have a letter prove that he, I had TB with the surgery. And the doctor was in the United States by then, and he wrote me the letter. Now, that paper, I don't, don't know what it is. I have to see it close. It says on the upshrift. Oh, this is identifying my parents' name and everything. Yeah, that's, they're saying that uh, my father and mother was uh, Moshe Hassan and Bohara, you know, and I was born in the Adelaide Rose, and I was taken there to, to Auschwitz. How many children do you have? Two. And what are their names? Rochelle and Jack. And do you have grandchildren? Yes, two. And their names are? Robbie and Jessica. Have you shared your experiences with your children and with others? No, when uh, my kids were growing up, uh, they were growing up, they used to come and ask me, what's this number? And I used to tell them, that's my phone number. My nephews, my nieces, everybody knew that was my phone number. I used to tell them, I don't want to forget the number. That's what it is. For years, my kids believed that was my phone number. Why did you tell them that? I don't know. I really, truly, I don't know. Maybe because I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. I figured if I was going to talk about the concentration camp, people, they're going to feel sorry. I don't want that. I'm a survivor. I know how to live. I'm a good mother. I'm a good wife. I don't need to tell them what I went through. And I was hiding it, which is wrong. Though this is the trouble. Like me, everybody did the same thing, you know? They hide the, we never, they never ask me a question. And I never want to offer the, uh, till one day after my husband died, believe it or not, Let's wait on this, and we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and pick it up. Okay. Thank you. We're back. Can you identify these photos? 
and start from left to right. Okay. In the bottom drawer, from left to right, my two grandchildren, Jessica and Robbie. The second row is my son-in-law, Gary Schuster, Dr. Gary Schuster, and my daughter. On the top row, it's my husband on the left and me. Then it's my son, Jack, and his wife, Debbie. And what's your daughter's name and your husband's name? My husband's name is Ralph, and my daughter's name is Rochelle. Thank you. Okay, now there is my uh, granddaughter to left to right, and the, uh, on your left, it's my daughter, uh, granddaughter Jessica on her bat mitzvah, and my sister Flora, the one in California, she came for the bat mitzvah, that's her. And on the right, it's me, my granddaughter, Jessica, and my daughter, Rochelle. Have you shared this experience with others? Now I do. I go speaking to schools, high schools, junior highs, and all that. I do go share this experience. What had it started was about seven years ago, well, I was in the car with my daughter and my granddaughter and my grandson. My granddaughter come and says to me, Noni, she calls me Noni, Noni, what's this number? I would start to say again, my telephone number. And my daughter says, no mother, you're not telling my kids what you told us. You're gonna tell her the truth. Then she says, this number is Noni was in the concentration camp. All her family was killed. And Auntie Flora and, and Noni, it's alive. And that's how I start speaking to the high schools. Then she asked me if I go speak in her class. That was the first, first time I spoke. If you had a message for future generations based on your experiences, what would that message be? Well. I, when I go speak to the kids, I say, you seen a survivor. You see my number. You heard my experience. You know it did happen. Holocaust happened. When you hear people say it never happened, that's not true. It did happen. It's in 15 years from now, you like any of the survivors, they're not going to live. They're not going to be around survivors. It's going to be up to you guys to keep it up, to keep it in memory of us in order to know that did happen. If we stop it now, then in 50 years from now it could happen. And this should never, never happen again. Thank you.